Hello again, everyone. Uh, may I ask you to be seated, please? Uh, si vous pouviez vous asseoir, please. I'm waiting for uh, Thierry to uh, give the go. Thierry? No, he's not listening. Uh, Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's start if you uh, if you don't mind. Uh, we're going to talk about international trade and investment, and I think there's no. It, it's a, it's a fascinating time to uh, to talk about uh, these issues. Uh, free trade, as you know, is uh, is a polarizing uh, issue more than ever in many in many countries. Uh, for many people, trade uh, is not synonymous of uh, prosperity, uh, and we talked about that earlier this morning a little bit when we talked about uh, the election of President Trump, uh, when we talked about Brexit, when we talked about um, uh, populism. Uh, I, uh, I saw this uh, statistic from uh, uh, from the uh, International Labour Organization saying that uh, uh, last year, 30% of workers, which means around 170 million, uh, were employed by exporting firms in 32 countries. But this number is, uh, is, is less than before the financial crisis. So that's uh, interesting to note. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, President Trump, of course, about protectionism, about China, uh, maybe also about emerging markets. Uh, after all, we're, we're here in a country uh, for which uh, international trade is, is really key. Uh, it's very important for Morocco to uh, uh, be involved in, uh, in international trade, and it's, it's very important for the development of this country. Uh, I would like to start with... Uh, um, if, if the presentation is, uh, is working, which I, I hope. I would like to start with, with you, Marcus. Uh, you're uh, um, executive vice president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics in, in Washington. It's a very well-known think tank in Washington. And uh, I give you the floor, Marcus. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here uh, this afternoon. I'm going to speak from the podium. I, I find that I tend to be more energetic if, I, if I'm standing than if I'm sitting. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk about uh, Trump administration international uh, economic policy. And I think the value added that I, I hope to deliver is some discussion of the specifics of process protection that's underway. And then I will make an argument about why the next couple of years may be particularly dangerous due to the interaction of Trump administration, macro, and trade policy. But first, I want to make a really simple point, which it is an explicitly protectionist policy. Last night, I went back and reread his inaugural address, and it contains the following passage. We must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. Protection will lead to great prosperity and strength. Now, that statement is a continuation of campaign themes. There was a focus on trade deficits, including bilateral deficits. And then there were two other themes that provide, from a Trump standpoint, both an explanation for the trade deficit and a location for the solutions. One was the issue of currency manipulation. The other was so-called disastrous trade agreements. There has been continuity post-inauguration. He has undertaken some executive actions that have tightened up government procurement, made it harder to get visas to come to the United States. And there has been an aggressive use of contingent or process protection, which I'll go into detail about in a moment. Finally, as we've heard from other speakers, there has been the withdrawal from the TPP and the renegotiations under threat of abrogation of chorus 
and NAFTA. Okay, what about that new protection? The United States, like other countries, have laws on anti-dumping and countervailing duties, but the Trump administration has been distinguished by two characteristics. One is the use of rather obscure parts of U.S. trade law, including the global safeguards, which doesn't even require injury to domestic industry, and the use of Section 232 national security protection. Moreover, the second characteristic is the Trump administration has been unusually uh, prone to self-initiate cases. And that matters because historically, if the government self-initiates the case, rather than waiting for a domestic uh, firm to complain, uh, there is the high, higher likelihood of protection actually being implied. So if you simply take the cases from the first 100 days of the Trump administration and assume, and this is an assumption, that protection is actually applied, as you can see in the upper panel, the share of US imports under protection doubles. And you see in the lower panel, it breaks down uh, that by country. South Korea would be the worst affected. Um, the problem for a country like South Korea is, while some of these policies are aimed at China, South Korea produces products such as solar panels and steel and washing machines that get caught up. South Korea is essentially collateral damage. The single biggest change in protection would be Canada because of the perennial softwood lumber case. And as somebody mentioned yesterday, the real problem with this is that given the United States prominence in the system, the likelihood that there will be um, emulation by other countries. The Trump administration, as we've heard, is also scrapping trade agreements. We are renegotiating NAFTA. Dick Cooper pointed out yesterday that some of that is a constructive agenda, updating. But what Dick didn't mention were the bad ideas that we heard some about this morning, a five-year sunset provision, which basically undercuts the idea of having a trade agreement because it means that companies cannot invest with any certainty about the rules of the game would be. Tighten rules of origin, particularly in automobiles. The rules of origin that the United States is uh, proposing on automobiles are designed to disrupt the existing supply chains. The North American auto market is highly integrated. If these rules go through, it will mean real inefficiency is introduced into that North American market. The long-term effect will be the movement of production from North America into China. Um, and as we heard uh, earlier this morning, these sort of strange arguments about trade balances. Um, if, the, uh, if the renegotiation fails and NAFTA is abrogated, the snapback for Canada is to the U.S.-Canada FDA, and you can imagine the U.S. and Canada basically working out a new deal that modernizes that agreement. But for Mexico, this, the threat is much more existential. Uh, there would be real impact in terms of production in Mexico, and strangely, from a Trump standpoint, the likelihood would be a depreciation of the peso and an increase in the bilateral trade imbalance, not a reduction. The Korea Free Trade Agreement was slated for uh, abrogation. Uh, fortunately, Kim Jong-un stepped in and with the sixth nuclear test took that off the agenda. But it's been simply pushed to the back burner and uh, there is still the possibility of abrogating chorus. Now, in anticipation of the election last year, uh, I did some modeling along with some colleagues at the Peterson Institute to look at what the impact would be on the United States, modeling trade wars with China and Mexico. And, as, and what you can see from um, that map is that um, the, um, the effects are significant and they are, they are not uniform across the states. Capital goods industries would be the worst hit, both because of the decline in domestic investments associated with the trade war, uh, as well as a reduction of exports of those goods. But what's really interesting is there are large employment losses in non-tradables, and because of the pattern of hiring in those sectors, what we find is that the, uh, the, the most of the US casualties in a trade war would be among the most vulnerable people in society. The, the effects of a trade war in the United States would be regressive. Uh, Washington, poor Washington, is the worst affected state. But we also looked at some scenarios that looked at asymmetrical forms of retaliation. Things like China stopping buying aircraft or having an embargo on soybeans or instructing state-owned enterprises not to buy US business services. And we've also looked at what might happen in some uh, cases if chorus were abrogated. That would include the loss of preferences in the beef market to countries like Australia, Canada, New Zealand. Uh, which we uh, expect would mean the elimination of U.S. beef exports, in, at least in the short run, as well as also loss of uh, business services to EU competitors. 
In the case of aircraft, aircraft production is highly localized. Certain geographical areas are hit hard. In the case of business services, the areas that are hit under either of these actions basically constitute a map of the high-tech urban areas of the United States. But from a political economy standpoint, possibly the most interesting part is um, the uh, two agricultural cases. Uh, you can see on the map uh, there is a, a patch of green that runs from Mississippi through Arkansas, Tennessee, and into Missouri. That's the impact of a soybean embargo by China. The, loss, the reason it's very interesting is twofold. First of all, if, say, you're in Seattle and you lose your job, you're losing your job, which is not good, but you're losing it in the context of a large urban labor market with public transportation. If you lose your job in one of those contiguous rural counties, uh, you are in real trouble. And the job losses, direct plus indirect, in some of these counties, one county was as high as 25%. There were about a dozen counties where it exceeded 10%. Likewise, in the beef case, you can see those yellow dots. They are in these sort of uh, plains states. The reason why this is interesting is that those areas are represented by Republicans. And uh, if, the, if the Trump administration is to be constrained politically, it is likely to become through agricultural interests in the United States. The real threat, though, is the interaction of the macro policy and the trade policy. Uh, we, the United States, for a variety of reasons, is likely to adopt uh, expansionary fiscal policy. That's going to lead to a growth spurt, widening budget and trade deficits, appreciating exchange rate. And then you face the prospect of uh, the Trump administration reaching for protection, trying to square the circle with that increasing trade deficit. And what we could get is a very nasty version of the first Reagan administration, that, that uh, an administration that, in the infamous words of then Secretary of Treasury James Baker, imposed more protection than any US presidential administration since Herbert Hoover. Uh, this is a, a period of time well known for voluntary export restraints. The uh, current uh, USTR, Mr. Ambassador Lighthizer, was actually one of the negotiators um, and is well versed with uh, this kind of action. There is one huge difference, though. In the context of the Cold War, and normally I have to say most of you don't remember that, but in the context of the Cold War, actually this audience, you do remember it. You were all senior officials at the time. Um, <clears throat> In the context of the Cold War, we were the ultimate, the United States was the ultimate uh, political and guarantor of Japan. And however grudgingly, at the end of the day, the Japanese were going to go along with American demands in the trade policy area. Needless to say, the relationship between the United States and China today uh, could not be more different. So just to recapitulate, um, oh, I just lost it. Um, this is a new policy. There is a real, there, this is a break with the past. It is explicitly protectionist. It is in the works. So some of these decisions for legal reasons have not yet been made, but they are in train. And the conflict between trade and macro policies are going to make it worse to the detriment of the United States and all of its trade partners. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Maybe we'll uh, discuss later uh, on, on the, the very points uh, to, uh, to know whether this uh, new policy, as you said, is, is here to stay or uh, if there, there are uh, prospects for, uh, for change. Let me turn to you, uh, Minister Bach. Uh, you uh, were Minister of Trade for uh, South Korea between 2011 and 2012 at a time when uh, I think your country was negotiating uh, a trade deal with China, uh, and now you are the head of a major think tank in, in Seoul, uh, involved in, uh, in trade and, and economy, LECO Global. Um, Minister. OK, thank you very much. Uh, based on my uh, area of interest, I would like to uh, uh, briefly discuss the uh, current state of the global trade governance. As all of you know, the Doha round uh, has been drifting for 16 years, and yet uh, we do not know uh, when and how it can be concluded. This kind of impasse uh, had never happened before since the start of the multilateral trading system of the WTO uh, in 1948. The 11th uh, WTO ministerial conference will be held in uh, Buenos Aires, uh, uh, Argentina, next month. To prepare this MC11, an informal mini ministerial meeting was held here in Marrakesh early last month. 
However, uh, ministers found that there are still sharp differences on major issues among the groups of countries, depending upon their own country's interest. As the multilateral trading system of the WTO was struggling with the Doha round, many countries actually have attempted to uh, liberalize their economy by seeking bilateral as well as regional FTAs. And most in, uh, rec recently, a new trend of forming a mega RTAs with the multiple participants has emerged, such as TPP, RCEP, and TTIP. However, as you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement will not be implemented. You know the reason why. Furthermore, the negotiations of other mega RTAs seem to be also prolonged. In addition, President Trump, you just heard from Marcus Noland, uh, America's first trade policy is making the global trading environment more uncertain and more unpredictable. Against this backdrop, uh, some international organizations and the leaders' forum have worked to improve the global trade governance. In particular, the G20, the premier leaders' forum for international economic cooperation, has made various efforts to restore the credibility of the global trading system. As we remember, at the 2015 Turkey G20 summit, leaders asked trade ministers to meet on a regular basis. Following this request, G20 trade ministers met in Shanghai in July 2016 and welcomed the establishment of the G20 investment and uh, trade investment working group. However, during this year's German presidency of the G20, trade ministers did not meet and no substantial agreement on the improvement of the world trading system was even included in the G20 summit declaration. Meanwhile, at the German G20 summit, leaders discussed the importance of fair trade and level playing field and recognized the role of trade defense instruments just like uh, anti-dumping or countervailing duties. It should be noted that G20 leaders at this time had more interest in fair trade than free trade. I would now like to make some suggestions in my own personal thinking on gro uh, global uh, trading system. First of all, the WTO members should seriously discuss how to save the multilateral trade negotiations. To save the Doha round, uh, serious discussions should be made at the upcoming MC11 to revise the agenda, which was written 16 years ago. Second, along with the multilateral negotiations, WTO members must consider taking different approaches to address further liberalization and new commercial rules. Given the nature of the decision-making mechanism of the WTO, we may need to seek for plurilateral agreements for certain issues among like-minded participants, such as government procurement agreement. Of course, if other countries who later satisfy certain requirements, they are allowed to join the agreement. Furthermore, if these agreements extend the benefits to all other non-participating members of WTO on an MFM basis, this agreement would become multilateral like the Information Technology Agreement. Third, we know that WTO's dispute settlement function has been respected despite the failure of the Doha round. However, recently, WTO has unable to fill vacant members at the WTO appellate body. This really hurts the credibility of the WTO's dispute settlement system. We do hope this problem to be resolved as soon as possible. Fourth, I would like also uh, emphasize that MC11 must produce a successful outcome which not, with another small package. Fifth, I would recommend the WTO members agree that investigation and imposition of trade defense measures should be consistent with WTO rules and purposes. In this context, I would be, uh, it would be extremely important that trade remedy systems are operated in a fairer, more transparent way. Sixth, I would like to note that there seems to be a growing consensus 
about the need to make all the citizens share the opportunities and benefits of trade liberalization. Regarding this issue, there are two important areas to focus on. First, we have to look at this issue from the consumer's point of view. In many countries, consumers often do not feel the benefits of trade liberalization. One of the main problems in this case is that distribution process of delivering imported goods from the border to the final consumers is extremely complicated, making the final price of the imported good much higher than the initial input price. From the consumer's point of view, expensive imported goods are not attractive, and therefore they cannot see the real benefits of trade liberalization. Major reform should be made in the distribution process of uh, imported goods. Second, we have to consider, reconsider the way to assist industries, firms, and laborers which are having difficult times from uh, liberalization. We, no we now need more inclusive policy schemes to assist losers from globalization and, and trade. As these two uh, issues, I would like to uh, recommend WTO, along with other appropriate uh, international organizations, study and suggest concrete uh, policy recommendations with best practices. Last but not least, I'd like to suggest that WTO members utilize their existing and future bilateral FTAs to further liberalize trade and reflect new commercial issues in the agreement. In other words, if the WTO members decide to have new FTAs or revise the existing ones, they should make the FTAs as modern as possible by including newly emerging trade rules, such as competition policy, e-commerce, trade remedies, state-owned enterprises, and investment facilitation, to name a few. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So interesting suggestions on how to uh, improve the global uh, trade system. And as we said, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a hard challenge uh, in, given the fact that uh, we need to find a consensus on these issues. Uh, probably you have also interesting suggestions uh, uh, to, uh, to make. Um, Francis Gurry, you're as the, as the head of uh, the uh, World Organization on uh, International Property. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Good morning to everyone. Actually, good afternoon, but it still feels like the morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I thank uh, Thierry de Montbriard for the invitation. Future of trade, it's a very large subject, of course, so uh, I would like to make comments on three, uh, really, areas or three forces that I think uh, will shape the uh, future of trade. Uh, of course, there's a certainty in what I will say, which uh, should not uh, be there at all. Uh, the first uh, area is, it rejoins really what was said in the last panel on artificial intelligence, and in particular by uh, Masoud uh, Ahmed, uh, and that is that I think the, that advanced manufacturing technologies are going to radically alter the nature of trade relations in the future. Uh, I'll take what he said and put it in a, uh, in a trade context. I think if you go back to the Uruguay round, and that is the multilateral framework that we have at the moment, uh, one way of looking at that round is that the basic deal underneath it was that the developed countries would uh, give more, uh, increase access to their markets with the consequence that jobs in low technology labor-intensive industries would be offshored. And in return for that, the developing countries would protect the conceptual input to production, namely intellectual property. And that, I think, shepherded, it was not the only reason, but it shepherded this enormous growth in global value chains that we've seen, uh, particularly in the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, and if you look at those global value chains, arguably, the greatest value lies in the pre-manufacturing and the post-manufacturing, that is in the design and conception and research and development, uh, and in the marketing, branding and distribution, and not in the manufacture. 
Now, with uh, advanced uh, manufacturing technologies, robotics, artificial intelligence, sensors, uh, and um, additive manufacturing, uh, I think that we're seeing the possibility uh, of the recapturing of manufacturing by industrialized countries. Uh, the example was given of Adidas, where uh, Adidas will have the capacity to be able to manufacture instead of using, using factories in Indonesia or Vietnam or the Philippines. That, um, I think, uh, that possibility, technological possibility, is joined by a political will, which we are seeing expressed, either to recapture manufacturing, and I don't think, I'm not talking here about the Trump administration, because I think the Trump administration is more old economy and not new economy, and when he talks about recapturing manufacturing, I think he's talking about traditional manufacturing and not new manufacturing. Uh, but we see a very, uh, I think, um, um, deliberate view that actually one of the reasons for recapturing manufacturing is because innovation follows manufacturing, uh, and that is a good reason to preserve manufacturing capacity. Uh, I think we see that also in the case of China very much uh, with its strategy on artificial intelligence, its strategy on manufacturing, uh, in this case, it's not uh, recapturing manufacturing, but preserving manufacturing. And this, of course, is going to uh, have a radical effect, I think, on the nature of trade relations uh, in the future, uh, and I'm not sure it's being uh, addressed. Uh, it, of course, uh, means that there will be increased in pressure on, uh, pressure on intellectual property. That pressure was all already there for the pre-manufacturing and the post-manufacturing because you're talking about patents and designs and branding, uh, but it will also uh, carry over, I think, into manufacturing in the future, uh, and this will be a major political issue. The second uh, force that uh, I would refer to uh, really is the whole digital economy um, uh, of which uh, the digitization of production, of which I just spoke, is only one part. But the whole digital economy, and in particular data. Now, it was said in the last session that algorithms are really the most important thing, and that uh, they are certainly important, but I think algorithms are nothing without data. Uh, and data is uh, the, I would say, suggest, the oil of the new economy. Uh, there is increasing value in data, both in the conception stage, in new business models for distribution, right across the production process. And it's created the behemoths uh, with which we're all familiar. Google, Facebook, eBay, Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba, and so forth. And I think if you look around the world now, uh, you see that governments are struggling to know how to deal with both data and the enormous enterprises that are built on the basis of data. There is a confluence of policy approaches that come into question. Uh, you have privacy, security, uh, data location, taxation, competition, ownership, uh, let's not forget, and trade all as perspectives. And I think one of the characteristics of the data economy is that it doesn't respect, of course, the architecture that has been put in place for trade relations in the past. And I don't see this really being addressed. I know the WTO is addressing e-commerce, uh, but I think, if I may say, it's a larger issue. Uh, and we are all struggling with policy approaches to uh, data. Uh, that really requires, I think, a fundamental rethinking of the system. Uh, and I fear that we no longer, or we do not have at the moment, the capacity to undertake that fundamental rethinking. And we don't have that capacity because, first of all, it concerns competitive relations, which are becoming more and more difficult. Secondly, internationally, the, the asymmetries in technological capacity are simply enormous, and that creates a difficulty in being able to address questions. And thirdly, and I think perhaps most importantly, the speed of the development of technology these days is such uh, that it far outstrips our institutional capacity to respond. 
And this is true at the national level, and it's even more true when you come to the international level. So then let me just make my final point, uh, which is that I think there will also be in the future a new model of trade relations, or it's uh, actually in the present, that is being pioneered by China. So we've spoken a lot in the course of the conference about the vacuum that is being left by the uh, uh, policies of the current Trump uh, administration, uh, but, and that that vacuum is creating an opportunity for many countries, and in particular China, to move into the space. But I don't think that, uh, if I may say, uh, that China will move into the space in the same way, or with the same model of trade relations. And in this respect, I would uh, invite you to consider, for example, the difference between the Trans-Pacific Partnership as one model and the Belt and Road Initiative as another model. Uh, very shortly, I think, the difference in the model is infrastructure as against accords or agreements. And I think it's broader than change. Uh, trade, it applies also to development. Uh, so uh, if you like in caricature, the old model is here are the rules, comply, and the new model is here is the road, trade. Uh, and I think this is going to have major institutional uh, or consequences for the institutional architecture. I would not wish to be thought to be suggesting by that that China is not a fully engaged member of the current multilateral system. It is absolutely fully engaged, but the model uh, for the future may be slightly different. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, so we talked about trade at a macro level, uh, and let me turn to, uh, uh, to, the, um, to the voice of business uh, coming from uh, Germany, the, biggest, the world's biggest exporter with China. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with you, Stefan, uh, you're um, a representative of the um, German Business Association, BDE. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and to speak on an issue which is of utmost importance for German industry. Uh, you probably know, as you already referred to, that exports make about 46% of our GDP. Um, you probably don't know that imports make for another 38%. So we are left with a foreign trade quota well beyond 80%. Just to compare, in the case of France, it's 45%. In the case of the US, uh, US, it's 25%, as far as I remember. So we are. We are very open, very globalized, uh, but also very exposed. Uh, I think this will get underlined also by investment. Uh, we have uh, more than 36,000 companies having invested more than one trillion euro um, uh, abroad. So as I said, um, very much globalized, uh, but very much exposed as well. So we follow the tendencies, the protectionist tendencies, with very great concern. Uh, and uh, to be clear on that, we rightly are these days preempted with um, um, the protectionist rhetoric and the measures taken by Trump, uh, but he's not the only one um, who resorts uh, to protectionism. Uh, since uh, 2008, when uh, the G20 countries committed themselves to keep the markets open, we could count for more than 2,500 trade restrictive measures. Some of them have take, been taken back, but still many of them are, are in place. So you look to China, where we, I think are still exposed to major hurdles to market access. Uh, we have a strong pressure on uh, localizing production in Brazil and Russia and many other places. Um, we have, uh, of course, Brexit um, in, in, in the European Union, where the British government interpreted it in a way that they have to leave the single market. And, of course, we have also very strong resistance against the trade um, transatlantic trade and investment uh, partners, uh, partnership in Germany. Very strong demonstrations on, uh, against that. So I think we have to look at the reasons for that and, 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 and see how we can deal with this. And I think there are, from my point of view, two very obvious reasons. One was already addressed in um, the session yesterday by Uwe de Dusch, um, as far as I remember, uh, saying that, of course, we had a decline of social inequality globally but we had an increase of social inequality in many major economies. And those people who feel left behind or 
think the jobs get lost to emerging economies, want the jobs get back. Uh, I think we can argue here for a while whether the job losses are due to technological change or to globalization, but at the end, from my point of view, here it's clearly the responsibility of national governments to deal with these problems, and to create uh, social safety nets, uh, to support those who lost their jobs in uh, retraining and uh, lifelong uh, learning, but also to invest in innovation um, and, uh, and research. The second reason, uh, clearly, for uh, protectionism, rising protectionism, I think is the sentiment of governments and societies that they lose control over unleashed global market forces. Uh, this was certainly reinforced by the financial market crisis. Uh, it was interpreted by these kind of unleashed uh, capital markets, which uh, caused the problem. And so the, the question is how to regain it. And um, it is uh, Danny Roderick who uh, phrased this um, globalization trilemma, said that, which says that you can't have hyperglobalization, as he called it, democratic politics and national sovereignty at the same time. Uh, either you, have to, you can always combine two of them. Um, quite obviously, most of the governments opted for the option to reinforce national sovereignty over globalization. I think this is very understandable, uh, as uh, first uh, it serves or addresses populist sentiments you have. Secondly, you have well-established instruments and policies to do so. And of course, it strengthens national governments, and in some cases, authoritarian rule. So it's, I think it's understandable that they did so. The problem is that, from my point of view, this option is not really able to cope with the global challenges we have. Uh, so we have to resort, from my point of view, to global governance, even if it means to weaken national sovereignty. Uh, and this is, from my point of view, and from the point of view of my federation, the clear uh, track we, we have to take. So we have, of course, strengthened supranational um, uh, cooperation governance in the European Union. And I hope that uh, uh, when we hopefully will have a, a government in Germany in some weeks, uh, that we can restart it together with France um, to really reform the European Union and to strengthen it, uh, supranational governance there. But also we have to reinforce WTO. This might sound a little bit naive as uh, the Trump administration seems to opt for a timeout in global governance, uh, but if is that so, then we have to talk to other partners um, uh, and test their willingness to develop, to bring forward global governance. Uh, governance. Might, might it be China, might it be Japan, India, African, Latin American countries? I think we, we have to do this, to do this effort and really to reinvest in, in, in global governance. Moreover, we have also to do some homework. I think we need, uh, especially in the European Union, a new consensus on trade policy. Um, we have, uh, in the past years, uh, I think, overloaded our uh, trade policy. Uh, uh, trade agreements have become more and more kind of basic treaties uh, with other governments, where we not only discuss trade, uh, but also investment, of course, but uh, labor standards, social standards, environment standards. So these are now really treaties hardly to negotiate, and, and to manage it at, at the end. And we have to rethink this. And we have to involve, of course, society, citizens on, on, on doing so. We, as, as BDI, started recently to do a series of town hall meetings on the future of trade policy. We will have not, some workshops with the critics of, uh, of, of TTIP and trade policy to, find, to try to find a new consensus on this. And the same, I think, is necessary for investment protection. Uh, we had a strong assistance in Europe against investment protection, but also many governments are about cancelling investment protection treaties because they find them unfair. So also we need to do more on this uh, to, to find a new consensus on that. Um, I think I, I stop here and, and leave it to the discussion to get a little bit deeper on some of the other issues. Thank you. Excellent. So now, Yi uh, uh, Xiaojun, you represent the authority here, but it's also uh, an authority that is under threat, and it must be sometimes difficult to uh, 
uh, to lead this uh, organization? How can you uh, respond to uh, all we all the um, criticism that uh, we've heard about um, world trade and, uh, and WTO in, in, in more specifically? Well, uh, thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, I'm happy to join this uh, panel to discuss the future of uh, world trade and the global trading system. And uh, many of you may have not uh, noticed that uh, last Monday this week, it's uh, uh, 30 October, marked 70th anniversary of GATT, which is the predecessor of WTO and origins of multilateral trading system. And uh, we believe that WTO and its predecessor, the GATT, hugely contributed to global uh, prosperity in the past decades. And uh, between 1950 and 2016, global GDP increased tenfold, while the global trade increased 39-fold. I think uh, it's largely due to the <laughs> increasing economic openness fostered by multilateral trading system. So I would like to make uh, three uh, points. First, now many people feel as if the global trading system is now on the verge of collapse. But actually, I think the multilateral trading system remains strong and solid we all saw the value of uh, this system during the financial crisis. And in 1930s, the financial crisis, I mean, the protection of the measures wiped out two thirds of the world trade. But uh, in, in the crisis of 2008, we didn't see such an escalation because our member governments knew that they were all bound by the multilateral rules. They knew where their boundaries were. So I truly believe that a multilateral trading system represents the best world effort to keep protectionism and economic tensions at bay. And my second point is we must be aware that many people feel disconnected from the economic progress. And uh, attitudes toward trade and globalization have hardened recently. And in some countries, tra trade is often singled out as a disruptive force in labor market. Well, trade does have effect. The technology and the technological progress is actually the major force driving changes and disruption. And it's true everywhere in any economy. Automation, digitization, new managerial techniques hugely reduced demand for labor uh, in employment. Uh, so we can see that uh, in reality, according to our survey, more than 80% of job losses are due to uh, productivity gains, due to technological progress, not to cheaper, labor, uh, cheaper uh, imports. But again, trade is often pointed as a culprit here. But in fact, as mentioned, technology and trade are essential for economic progress. We cannot reject those forces. Instead, we had better embrace and adapt. So I think the... Uh, The current trend of turning against the trade will, solve, uh, will not solve any problem. Instead, raising barriers to trade 
will only make uh, the situation even worse. They will not bring the jobs back. So the better response to these uh, 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 challenges is to have a more active domestic policies to support workers and equip them with the skills to compete in the modern marketplace. So let me move to uh, my third point. It's also the, the, the topic of the today. I think the key question before us today is about the future of WTO. I truly believe that none of the global trade challenges can be easier solved outside of multilateral trading system. In fact, the opposite is the case. For example, you can hardly imagine that you can manage an increasing borderless digital economy or respond to the globalization of the internet through bilateral agreements. It is also impossible for countries to limit their agriculture or fishery subsidies via regional ar arrangements. I'm not trying to say that uh, bilateral or regional approaches are not important. They absolutely are. But uh, what I'm trying to say is they are on their own. They, are, they cannot be sufficient. They can only uh, supplement multilateral trading system, and they can act as bloody, uh, 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 block, uh, 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 building blocks for the global system. But the multilateral approach is essential and indispensable. Nevertheless, I believe that the WTO can and should do more to evolve and to improve. I mean, before us, there are a lot of long-standing issues, as uh, uh, Minister Bark mentioned. When you were the minister, you discussed those issues, like uh, agriculture subsidies, fishery subsidies, domestic regulations of services sectors, and so on. Those issues are still standing there to be resolved. But meanwhile, we also see that there is increasing interest among some members to discuss those forward-looking issues like e-commerce and investment facilitation. However, we have to recognize that there is no easy or obvious solution on any of those fronts. Because we, if we want to find a solution, we need to get consensus. That is to say, we need to bring all the WTO members on board. It's very challenging and very difficult. Ultimately, the future of WTO is in the hands of its members. We are a member-driven organization. So it is there, I mean, our members shared responsibility to bolster global economic cooperation and to leave a strong and well-functioning multilateral trading system for future generations. Let me stop here. Just, just a quick follow-up, but are you suggesting that this is a, an issue of uh, governance at the WTO? You mean the, the governance? I think it's the... Uh, Economic governance is a, a global issue in a lot of international organizations, in IMF, World Bank, WTO, and uh, we have to face that challenges. But uh, the current problem is we lack of the leadership in WTO, so that's why I said we hope all members share collective uh, responsibility to promote multilateral uh, uh, trading system and to keep it strong. Okay. We're going to open the discussion to uh, the floor. Yes, sir. And Madam, after. So. Thank you. My name is uh, Douglas Paul. I'm from Carnegie Endowment, Washington, D.C. Uh, 
In recent months, in various forums, U.S. Trade Representative Lighthizer has said that from his experience, the WTO was never outfitted with the tools to manage a mercantilist approach to the economy that China now brings, and that China d does this in such a sweeping, uh, challenging scale that the U.S. should work to fundamentally readdress the principles on which the WTO is founded. I'd be interested in your reaction to that characterization. Well, I, I don't think the U.S. is going to leave the multilateral system because uh, uh, the system itself was created by the U.S. seven decades ago, and uh, it worked in the U.S. national interest in the past. But uh, I understand that the U.S. or the current administration wants to uh, uh, improve it and uh, make it uh, uh, working uh, more efficiently and for their interests. But uh, it's up to our members to make decisions how they reform the system. And uh, as for China, I think it's important to, personally, I think it's important to uh, engage China and work China within the system instead of a confrontation outside of the uh, 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 global system. It's my uh, personal view. Minister. Well, um, regarding the multilateral trading system, uh, the Deputy uh, Director General already mentioned the decision-making process at the WTO requires consensus. But it has been working quite all right until certain time period. Now, given the power shift uh, in the world economy, the two, you know, many, many different uh, emerging countries are confronting with the United States and EU. That means you never have any consensus on any difficult issues. That's the kind of thing we got stuck with. If you go to IMF and World Bank, there's a, a, a board system. They have a weighted, weighted voting so that they can have some kind of solution. But at the WTO, one country, one vote requires consensus. That means we must admit uh, it'll be awfully, awfully difficult to make any kind of sensitive decision. This is how we you know, prolonged for 16 years to conclude even uh, Doha round. I mean, we, we never had that kind of uh, occasion before on the GET system. So that's the problem we have to solve. Yes. Uh, only briefly, I think what we really have to get used to is that we, we live in a world of global governance, which is mainly shaped by the United States with some assistance of the European Union. Uh, and now we have new forces who claim that they also would like to shape global governance <laughs> to a certain degree. So if I think if we want to maintain global governance structures, we somehow have to react on that. We have then, as you said, engage in a di discussion how to change it, how to reform it. And we as Americans and European Union, I think, need a consensus how far we are willing to go uh, and where the limits are of the adjustments we are willing to make uh, with regard to mercantilistic um, efforts, with regard to the role of uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, with regard of government sub uh, subsidies. So I, I still hope that there's some willingness on the Trump administration to have this dialogue between Washington and Brussels, because if we do it on our own, then we have end up in real trouble. And, and, and so I would really very much argue for, for finding a new consensus in this, how to deal with China. The lady in the front, yes, and then. Well, thank you, Asya Ibn Salha Alawi, Ambassador at Large of His Majesty Mohammed VI. My question goes to Stefan Mayer. You have suggested as potential answers to the rise in protectionism to improve governance, both supranational government in Europe and, of course, the to uh, alien WTO address its woes. Uh, my question is uh, how you do that at a moment where Europe is totally reluctant to any strengthening of its supranational, you have even said the word, <laughs> you know, move 
And second, do you think that the, uh, what we call the couple uh, Franco-Allemand uh, is strong enough to address this issue? And uh, second, what would be the uh, chances to get there, knowing you know, that the populists are basically against any kind of reinforcing you know, Europe? Uh, the other question is related, of course, to WTO, and which is much more recent than the historic international organization, but which is totally, are we condemned to paralysis? What you, as deputy director general, are proposing. So are we going to be prisoner you know, of this consensus impossible to reach forever? And as far as the reforms of the international organization, the uh, economic organizations, we do know it's been on the agenda for quite a long time. Everybody's aware of the discrepancy and anachronism between their functioning and the requirements of the changing and evolving. So what are the suggestions, except of saying that we are in a sort of quagmire and that we have to get uh, Trump's administration and the EU and the major uh, throw in. Of course, knowing that the voiceless, who is the third world and the, even the emerging countries, have no say in this respect. So what are potential uh, avenues to get out of this uh, uh, total you know, uh, blockade? Shall I really Excellent point. point. Yes, sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I might be more positive on the European Union than the majority of, of the people here in the, in the hall. I think that we have really a great, a great chance next year to restart it. So we saw the victory of a French president which clearly had an anti-populist agenda, uh, countering the main demands, and he won the elections. And of course, we have now in Germany a right-wing party in parliament, but still a very broad consensus about the major parties, about the pro-European uh, policy. And, uh, and as far as I see, we have the chance, beginning of next year, to revive the European Union, to restart the discussion on how we would like to shape it. And Brexit might help to a certain degree, because uh, many member states of the European Union are about to learn now what it means to leave the European Union and not to have it. But this won't be sufficient, as I said. It's, I think it's very important uh, to strengthen supranational efforts within the uh, European Union, but also to enforce the dialogue with other partners. Uh, and here, we still leave it mainly to the member states uh, to do so, and we, ha we have also strengthened the European Union to do so. And not only, of course, to talk to our classical traditional partner, but also to look beyond and see who else might be a, in, have an interest in, in strengthening global governance and uh, who might have proposals we can agree to or we, we at least have to discuss. So I'm, I'm a little bit more positive than your uh, questions um, uh, tend to. Can I just add something? Um, the, both of the questions have a kind of commonality of what do we do in a period of lack of leadership. Um, I think that given the problems the WTO has moving forward, uh, and the difficulties that the United States and China have in the economic relationship, I think there's a case for the US and China to basically take it outside the WTO and, and settle these issues bilaterally. Uh, for example, we have in the WTO right now the issue of China market economy status. Um, I personally think it's, over, it's overestimated because of the nature of protection in the United States. Whether you grant China MES or not is not going to have dramatic impact on market access, but it's an issue. I think you could see a situation where the United States and China just say, look, we're, we're major powers. We're going to settle this. And you could have, in the case of MES, for example, uh, you would grant MES in sectors where China looks like it's really marketized, and you wouldn't grant it in sectors where state-owned enterprises uh, have a dominant position. And you can kind of go through, and, and in return, you know, you would have the United States granting some constraints on the application of anti-dumping and, and, and countervailing duties. The real risk is if China pushes a case like this through the WTO, that the United States will not comply, and in the end, the Trump administration could simply pull the US out. I don't think that's likely. I want to be very clear, I'm not predicting this. But I would also simply observe that the United, under current law, the President of the United States could pull the US out of the WTO without any congressional oversight. 
So I think uh, given the sort of dysfunction in the WTO, it is a very risky game for China to really press these cases with the United States. I think it would be better, frankly, given the condition of the WTO, to settle it amongst ourselves. Francis, you wanted to add something. So um, in relation to the ambassador's last question, um, I think this is an extraordinarily important issue. It's a major, major issue. The whole multilateral system architecture is frozen. And uh, this is across all organizations. It's not just the WTO. Uh, and uh, cannot find the way to move forward. And I think that we really have to address this because at the same time, never have problems been uh, more global in nature and therefore more in need of multilateral solutions. So three suggestions, uh, small suggestions are, first, maybe we have to accept a multi-speed system. Okay, so that's a heresy in traditional terms. We've moved the whole international community forward over the past 60, 70 years together so that everyone is comfortable. Maybe we have to accept now that you can have a multi-speed system. Uh, and that means that uh, you would permit plural plurilateralism within multilateralism. So if some groups of member states want to go forward to something, then I think that should be permitted, provided it doesn't unduly damage the interests of the others. Uh, now, that's again a major change and, uh, to the system. Uh, and then thirdly, I think that we are seeing a change in the nature of international cooperation. You know, for uh, 100 years or more, uh, the instrument of cooperation was the treaty. Uh, and in today's networked world, platforms can be as important as treaties. And it's much easier to get a, a cooperation underway with a platform. Uh, those who want to join it, join it. Um, and uh, so I think we should perhaps think in these terms as well. What really paralyzes the system is trying to reach a multilateral treaty agreement. Sir. Oh, no. thank you very much. Uh, this, my name is Ta Sano, in the Jones Day of Tokyo. Well, so my question is, the, based on the my previous experience as a negotiator is in Uruguay round. I think the biggest success in the Uruguay round is the establishment of dispute settlement. Or any kind of the treaty or contract or agreement, final enforcement should be done by the, some kind of dispute settlement mechanism itself. Now there's a two issues. One thing is it's about the dispute settlement issue of the WTO, and also this is one, one, another jeopardizing thing is the, as Mr. Mayor said, that ISDS agreement or the mechanism. These two should be this one of what is some kind of the final result to solve a certain kind of question. The protectionism itself is not just against a liberalization or something like that. Important thing is we need to have such kind of legal infrastructure. And it seems to me right now that's according to, well, reading some kind of newspaper that the appellate body of dispute settlement mechanism is in WTO. It's really jeopardized by not having all the nominees in the WTO appellate body. I think you have the seven members or some, and already three is completely absent. And it's maybe next year that would be just only three in the, uh, out of seven, the members of the appellate body, is if I'm, I'm, I'm correct. And that completely paralyzed the, uh, such a dispute settlement mechanism is one thing. And about ISDS, the, in the TPP, we try to have the ISDS, but to my, to my knowledge, TPP 11, some of the countries is try to just delete the such an ISDS issue. 
And the same thing in, in NAFTA. Okay, it is it's, it's the, one of the ISDS. Another one is arbitration mechanism of the anti-dumping anti and countervailing duty issue, which is both, this quite important, the chapter in NAFTA, but that is completely challenged. And so the many of the, what to say, uh, the now the FTAs or the, some of the bilateral, mm -hmm. the <clears throat> investment agreement and so on, the ISDS cannot be the really centerpiece of the treaty now. How do you think about that? Is this from the business side, from Maya, and is it from Mr. E? What's going on is on WTO in that kind of issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Should, should I react on this? Uh, I think we made a decision in Europe right now to separate investment protection from trade policy. Uh, the, the future trade agreements we will have will be mainly on trade, and we will deal with investment protection separately. On the other hand, I think we have also a really major um, uh, issue of innovation, our CETA uh, treaty, our agreement with Canada, where we um, created a kind of international investment court dealing with ISDS. Uh, and uh, we learned that this is more acceptable to our critical pub public to have that, so not to leave it to really private structures, but to have the states have a strong say in, in, in how to set up this court. And this is certainly an innovation we proposed uh, to uh, the United States uh, in the context of TTIP, and which we will certainly also propose to Japan in our uh, free trade agreement with, uh, with Japan and all the others we will uh, negotiate. Uh, we, we think this is a major issue of innovation we have. Yes, you wanted to add one quick one? Yeah, I mean, about ISDS, it's not the same for all kind of ISDS because uh, Korea US FTA included ISDS, but we attach a lot of conditions. So uh, private companies cannot sue the government for certain areas, especially social policies like environment and labor policies. So attaching that kind of uh, uh, conditions, uh, ISDS could be a good uh, uh, foundation to protect the investors. But uh, if you just simply you know, include IS ISDS, maybe domestic uh, mm -hmm. constituencies are not uh, supporting that kind of uh, inclusion. OK, you wanted to add one last word, Mr. Yi? Yes, very short. Uh, first of all, I, I, I would encourage our members to uh, resolve the crisis on everybody uh, uh, member issue. I think uh, it's in all of their interest. And secondly, I think the multilateral dispute settlement mechanism is working much more efficiently than uh, RTAs because we checked all the uh, dispute settlement mechanism or provisions in RTAs were very rarely used. But uh, if you check WTO record, we, in, the, in the past uh, 21 years, we handled uh, more than 500 disputes very efficiently. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending and thank you for your great questions. Thank you.